All right. I think I counted five analysts this morning already that presented or were mentioned. We have five more today to make sense of the quantum computing universe. First, David Shaw, who is the director of Fact-Based Insights and the author of numerous business and investor-oriented articles, uh, working extensively in consulting, market analysis, and advisory. You're here from London. I am indeed. What uh, does an analyst do all day? So an analyst has to provide an independent view of uh, the market and what's happening in the market. Uh, and sometimes that means the analyst has to ask the questions that other people are too polite to ask. We will uh, do our best uh, not to be polite in the next uh, half hour. Next uh, joining is uh, James Sanders. He's a research analyst for quantum computing and cloud differentiated silicon on the cloud and managed services for 451 Research, part of S&P Global. Welcome, James. Thank you. What makes a good analyst? Someone who can ask the really unexpected question, get people thinking, and get people outside of their box. All right, we'll explore that. Uh, Shaheen Khan, who is the founder and uh, main partner at uh, Orion X, his focus on technologies, policies, and communication strategies that drive the information revolution. Shaheen, how should a customer pick an analyst? I see. Uh, well, I used to be on the other side of this, and how I used to do it, and I liked how I did it, was that you pick the analyst, not the firm, and then you find out what they're good at and how they can contribute to what it is you're trying to accomplish. I personally favor using many of them because I think each one brings a different perspective, and I think you can draw a lot out of them if you use them properly. Wonderful. Uh, last and uh, not least, the OG of quantum computing analysts, Doug Finke from Quantum Computing Report. Uh, before getting into quantum, he spent uh, time at uh, IBM uh, with the world's largest computer. Maybe we can learn more about that. Semiconductors at Intel and storage at Western Digital. So would you, that makes the 10th analyst uh, this morning, according to my count, is there hype in the analyst industry? Are, are we guilty ourselves? Well, I think there is some hype. Um, you know, there are a lot of people who try to analyze the market that may not understand it. They may have some unrealistic ex expectations about it. So, you know, it is important to get multiple sources to, you know, look at what, what different people say. But I would also, you know, make sure that people take everything they see with, with a grain of salt and try to cross check it against each other to see you know, what perhaps the consensus is or get opposing opinions to really understand what's happening in the market. Good, and uh, as we prepared for this, we mostly were in consensus about all the topics we discussed. Uh, we'll try to change that over the next 27 minutes and seven seconds. Let's start looking at the products and um, how to assess performance. We are all familiar with um, qubit, count, quantum volume. IBM just uh, released a new metric, CLOPS. Uh, a great paper by the QEDC. Um, what do all these metrics mean and how should a user think about that? Dave, when you talk to customers, what are they actually looking for to, to make sense of this mysterious quantum computing thing? Well, I think uh, the, the metrics that have been defined, I think per se, they make a lot of sense. Uh, there's a role for a number of qubits, there's a role for quantum volume, there's a role for clocks. Uh, one of the things I like about I like a lot about the, the Q, uh, QEDC format. It's beautiful, but it also matches with the quantum volume. It, it, it meshes into it, and it can give you a really uh, intuitive sense of what's going on. But I, I do think that one of the things that that it's in danger of hiding is that the fidelities in the devices today just aren't good enough. Uh, it, it's been a thing in, in the field for you know, some time to talk about two, two qubit gate fidelity being above 99%. And, and, and that was fine when it was exciting just to, to be theoretically possible. But what we see today, uh, when we've learned about what it looks like to build a, a genuine practical fault tolerant device, it's really the barrier has got to be 99.9. It's got to be three nines. Or, or you've got to come to school with a, a note from your head of error correction saying why it's going to be OK for you. And, and to be honest, if you're going to do something in NISC, I, I think it's got to be four nines. And, and the devices are, are not there. And what we should be asking the presenters when they, they come with their, their, their nice presentations, we should be asking them to demonstrate what in their roadmap gets them 
to the fidelities that are actually required. Because what we're looking for is practical quantum computing, mm -hmm. the title of our talk. How do you explain practical to, to a customer not using this lingo, which very few understand? Something that's going to provide real business value. And yes, that's a cliche, but businesses understand the problems that they have. It's going to take a lot of effort to translate those problems into something that you can run onto a quantum computer. But that time's kind of around the corner. Is, is that the, the feedback that you're getting, Shaheen? Uh, who, who are your customers? Who do you talk to? And what are they telling you? Um, let's, let's flip this question around. Well, are we still talking about performance or practical computing? Uh, please, please make So your for case. the performance, I think that you have to remember what these benchmarks and characterizations are. They are essentially to characterize the system, not as a buying guide. You don't use it to select what to buy. You use it to understand what you're dealing with. And the value of these benchmarks and metrics shows up over time. You do it year after year after year, and you start seeing a baseline, and you see how the progress is going. As long as they are close and they are relevant, they're going to really add value. And I really applaud IBM for doing the good work of introducing both quantum volume and now CLOPS. Both of them are valid and great way to look at things. And I think that's really about it. You know, so th let's not take them like, you know, they're not supposed to be the exhaustive, inclusive everything. They're supposed to like, tell you what it is that you're dealing with. In terms of practical computing, really the, 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 the model that comes to my mind is that you know, one person's product is another person's solution. The question is practical for who? Right? So for somebody who's really doing research, it's highly practical. If you're trying to run PowerPoint, OK, you may have to wait a file before you can run it on a quantum computer. Yeah, I was going to add a little bit to that. You know, there's no one metric that's going to tell you what the best quantum computer is. You know, everybody has slightly different applications, and different different uh, metrics are going to be important to you. It's sort of like if you're buying a car. You know, some cars have better mileage, some cars have better horsepower, some cars have better zero to sixty times, and you know, computing is the same way. Um, I think that the best way to look at it. You should look at the metrics and understand what they're saying. But the best thing to do is try to find something that's similar to your end application that you're trying to do. And maybe build a toy model and run that toy model on several different quantum computers and see which gives you the best result. And we haven't even touched on different modalities yet that complicate this picture. Um, how, how do you think about the dot duck? And you mentioned roadmap, so there's a timeline element. To, to it as well. Um, how do you speak to customers that uh, call you up and say, Doc, what should I do? Well, well, first of all, I'll tell them that if you talk to a vendor, they will swear that their technology is the best. <laughs> but in, in reality, no one really knows. I, I, I think um, there's still a lot of research. We're still in the very, very early stages. Um, I, I would, again, tell people to stay flexible. Uh, if you have a problem, try it on a, a variety of, of, of different machines. There's going to be a lot of changes in the technology over the next 10 years. And some of the people who are leaders today uh, may not be the leaders. Uh, and, and we've seen that before. You know, certainly, we've seen that in the computer market. We've seen that in the semiconductor market. Uh, you know, we've even seen it uh, in, in other markets. So. Um, I uh, don't give any predictions about which technology is going to win out at the end, because I, I think no one really knows. We will give predictions uh, at the end yeah. of this talk, and you wrote yours down, so no, yeah. no way around it. Um, but is what you're saying that more so than the technology and the products, what we really need to evaluate is the vendors and, and the startups as a partner? I, I, think, I think absolutely. I think. Uh, what a lot of end users are going about uh, needing to do at the moment is, is not pick a technology. It is pick the company or companies they're going to work with. And, and, and I think it, it leads on to a point that, you know, everyone here, everyone's excited about the technology and the algorithm. But actually, we have to start looking at the companies and the company leadership because strategy is, is important as well. You know, these are, these are some very significant, uh, significant companies now out here in the field, the, the unicorns in the field. And I think it's very interesting, actually, to look at some of the presentations we'll have uh, this week. Uh, 
Uh, you know, we've got uh, you know we, we've got Ilias Khan, we've got Tony Utley from Cambridge Quantum, and uh, and and Honeywell, and of course the the burning question is, how do you say the new name? But, a, I, but I have a, too many wells done. <laughs> but a, but apart from that, but apart from that, you know they they've got some great pieces in the field. But what we have to see from them is the story of how they're going to make that uh, a, a unified vision, and how that can be more than the sum of its parts. And, and I see also we've got, we've got Peter Chapman speaking tomorrow. And I don't know what Peter's going to say. But I tell you, the name of his talk is exactly the right name. And congratulations to the PR agency that probably is up in the multi-million dollar <laughs> category that, that came up with that name. Um, through my one quantum organization, we look at leaderships and teams in quantum. Um, uh, you might have seen those uh, slides, 95% are white males and probably scientific, um, and not a lot of business acumen, not a lot of uh, diversity. Um, what is the strategies that customers and users are asking for or, or lacking um, that, that the community, the vendors aren't uh, offering yet? The kind of difficult thing about quantum computing is quantum computer companies, I don't think, know what they want to be yet. If your ambition is to be the next Intel, fantastic. That's probably a good route for you to go. Given the potentially transformative uh, potential that these systems have, what if you want part ownership of what you're developing? What if you know, the, the partners that you're working with, your prospective customers or you know, just customers, what if when you were developing the algorithm that they need to run on your quantum computer. What if you have part ownership of that? And at that point, it becomes more of a managed service, doesn't it? And I think there's going to be a bit of a apprehension as we get further on in the next three to five years of, do we want to be a, just a provider of compute? Do we want to be more, do we have, want to have more ownership of the change that we're going to make in the markets downstream from quantum. And with that, I, I think it's going to be a, a kind of soul-searching thing, really. Um, you know, how, do we, how do we bring in more people into quantum computing? How do we you know, reach out from just the scientific venues uh, and go to the people who actually have these problems that they need desperately solutions for? And how do we ensure that there's equitable access to this hardware so that problems that affect maybe an uh, underserved minority will still have access to the potentially transformative effects of quantum computers? Very consensual panel so far. And Shaheen, you're nodding your head. But uh, No, I was going to. Actually, I think the workforce diversity is obviously one of the critical issues not just in quantum computing, because we live in a world where with AI and 5G and cryptocurrencies, and I put that in, and, 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 <laughs> and quantum you. computing, it's like, it, you know, how do you keep up with all of that? And where's the workforce for this going to come from? And of course, Professor Oliver talked about every, all the good stuff that you know, those guys are doing to do this. Now, the other thing I wanted to say, though, is the grassroots. There is tremendous grassroots activity for quantum computing. So I will give you like a recommendation. Go Google Quantum Palooza and University of Harrisburg. Terrell Franz, professor of uh, quantum computing and, at, and that university is here in the audience. Go to Washington Quantum Computing Meetup. And you know, we have like, event, I mean, they have, I just sort of participate. They have like events every other week and you see people like a graduate student from Egypt. You see somebody from Argentina. You see somebody from Poland. And the diversity that you see there women, minorities, all over the map is awesome. So please go support it. You know, put your mouth where your money is, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Terrell, if you're in the audience, raise your hand. Everybody needs to meet Terrell. You really do. He's I just, uh, <laughs> not here, it seems, but uh, you'll, you'll find him. He has a loud laugh. Um, before we move on uh, to the next topic, Doug, any disagreements with what has been said so far? Quantum computing, we have the performance metrics, it seems, um, it is about strategy, it's about teams, it's about diversity, the use yeah, cases. Let me, let me just follow up on some of the diversity inclusion. 
You know, we just saw earlier Bob Sorensen's uh, market estimate. And the question is, why can't it be better? What is holding quantum computing back from you know, being more revenue? And I, I believe that it's really two fundamental things. Uh, the most important one is the lack of people. We're going to need every qualified engineer and scientist we can get to make this technology happen. And there probably will be some companies in the next few years that will miss their revenue targets just because they can't recruit enough people. So it's, it's really important that we try to include as many people as possible. There's a lot of great efforts, you know, the, the uh, woman in quantum thing, the one quantum thing, but there are many others that are, that are sponsored by the government. And uh, I'll just end with a little bit of advertisement. Uh, this afternoon, we have a session called Q2E that will talk about that topic sponsored by QEDC. And if you're interested in that topic, uh, you can you can attend it later on this afternoon. And uh, Women in Quantum Awards at four o'clock where we will uh, recognize female entrepreneurs, scientists, and community builders in quantum. Uh, Matt Johnson uh, this morning kicked us off with a couple slides that had data on them. And uh, Matt, if you hear us, please come see us. We might want to look at that data. But um, we hear a lot that investments in quantum are just exploding and, and up tremendously. I disagree with that. If you dig into the data, you actually see that VC money, private money, is just slightly up, maybe 15% or so over last year. What is up are these big deals, the SPACs and, and other public offerings. How should people think about uh, investments and this investment hype? Um, Doc, uh, let's uh, well, I, I look at it on a longer you. time frame. If you think about 10 years ago, who was investing in quantum is really the government. You know, the government through you know, these various research labs were funding some of the very basic exploratory research. Uh, over the next few years, let's say within the past five, six years, then, then the VCs came along. And I think probably the most interesting thing that happened in the quantum industry in 2021 was the entrance of the public markets for, for, for quantum. You know, we, we have these SPACs. Uh, we'll probably have some more SPACs, uh, maybe some IPOs next year. And it is another source of funds, which you know, we, we shouldn't discount because it's going to be quite significant. And you know, I think we all understand that quantum is going to require lots and lots of funding to, to really reach its full potential. Investors are very excited about quantum, is that right, David? Mm -hmm. I think there's, there's, there's one additional bit of context that I think it makes sense to keep your, your handle on, uh, which is th there is a wall of money in the wider VC market at the moment. A lot of money trying to find places to go. And, and it puts even sharper into contrast your, your starting point about, well, why haven't we seen an uptick in that? And, and, I, and I, I think it's important to understand that there's really two questions. There's one of the questions that the, the VC general partners themselves are asking, and they're, 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 they're typically talking about things like, oh, the, the quality of the management team and how that can be configured. And they're, they're classic and very valid VC considerations. But then the other question is, what are the limited partners in these VC funds saying? And it's, it's the limited partners that actually stump up the money. And, and, and I have the opportunity to interact with some. And, and, and one of the things they're very frightened of is the, is the the, the, the technical question of how do you back the right, the right thing. The technical due diligence here is very difficult. That type of expertise in, in, in the generalist VCs is thinly spread when you're trying to take on a difficult technology like this, where it's, it's, it's you know, compared to other, other deep technologies, there are some, you know, there's this, there are some of these things that if, if you've not got that particular ability to challenge into the, the heart of the quantumness, it's difficult for you. Uh, and, and I think that's a barrier uh, that uh, gets in the way of, of um, money feeling comfortable to find its way to where it deserves to be. Great point. General partners, GPs are the one who run an investment, source the deal, do the due diligence, administer the, the company uh, later on, LPs, limited partners, uh, actually give the money, family offices, other fund, uh, wealthy individuals. GPs are super excited, super aggressive. Uh, limited partners have a much more limited understanding of uh, this technology and the risk that comes with it. 
do these investors use our data? Do they call you and ask them, hey, James, what's, what's up in quantum? Sure they do. <laughs> so one of the benefits of being part of S&P Global, um, and 451 Research was acquired by S&P Global about two years ago. So we're in the market intelligence group is we've got access to what's called Capital IQ Pro. And in the Capital IQ Pro platform, and everyone wants to have their own market sizing, but in the Capital IQ platform, by Thanksgiving, we found that over $1 billion had been invested in quantum computing companies. Not quantum security, but quantum computing companies so far this year. And I think that's a milestone, honestly. I, I know that uh, there's going to be other people who have their own methodology who will come up with a different number. But um, with this, I think the interesting thing is, yes, there is SPAC money. And I, I share your concerns that the SPAC trend gives me a little bit of pause because I'm, I'm not sure that we really want to marry, a, let's say, untested financial vehicle with an unproven scientific vehicle. <laughs> that, um, that should concern people. Like, this is... This is the, the new frontier of computing. And I, I don't know that SPACs are really going to be the, the thing that's going to get it over the line. Okay, but, okay. Yeah, okay. yeah I, 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 I would just make a slightly different emphasis there, I think. I think you, one needs to separate SPACs as a vehicle for getting to market, which is one thing, and there's, you know, you, yeah. you can say. There's a separate thing. But actually, once you're there and, and you're now a publicly listed company, that's, you know, that's, that's per se, that's fine. But the challenge, of course, is it's a difficult thing to do to run a publicly listed company yes, uh, it is. in this type of thin revenue market. And, and, but, but it gives you advantages as well if that means you've got resources and, and you can do something sensible with that if you can articulate the vision. So the challenge is for the leadership of these companies to step up to the plate and paint that vision and, and lead it to success. Absolutely. And as, as you stated before, I think that's going to be the, the more important part once you finally get over that line. Uh, I, do, I do worry about, um, and based on the trends that we've been able to see, it seems this, this back trend is decreasing a bit. I think there's probably going to be less of that next year. There's you know, rumors of a, a couple of these uh, quantum companies going public through a SPAC. Uh, I think there's two that people tend to talk about. Um, but I, I think overall, and this is you know, outside of quantum, I think that, that trend is going to decrease in the next year. Um, it's just the, the, the potential of people latching on who don't really have an understanding of either quantum or SPACs, yeah, frankly, I agree with that. Um, making, making, this, uh, making things into meme stocks, for example. Yeah. Sure, sure, Shaheen, bring, bring us home. Uh, are investors that. going crazy? Yeah, Do yeah. we need to buy Bitcoin yeah, and dollar <laughs> spec? Yeah. Or... <laughs> yeah, I'm going to spend a few Bitcoins and let me set you straight. So investors know what they're doing. So I think especially investors who participate in more sophisticated vehicles do know what they're doing. And if they want a seat at the table, they're going to get a seat at the table. And by the way, a billion dollars is nothing. Go to the AI world. Now, they're a little ahead of us in terms of what actually works or has a promise of working. But for a startup with no revenue and like a half a dozen people to raise $700 million is like common. Being even a unicorn is like, unicorn is so passe. You're like a kilocorn is what we want, <laughs> right? So, so really, let's, re let's recalibrate. You know, here's a technology that can be literally game-changing, like it's been used before, for, for good reason. And to invest in it and to have a seat at the table is almost imperative. So let's not get too worried about these things. Investors are fine. You know, now, you don't want, it's tricky to sort of be, be realistic and still paint a, you know, a positive, um, optimistic picture. You don't want to mislead people. But you also want to like, make sure that this thing advances like it's supposed to. And um, a fun game to play uh, because of these SPACs, uh, INQ and Rigetti had to publicize their financials. If you dig through that, you can see how much money they actually burn, spend. Uh, it's an expensive uh, game to play. Stuff costs money. It costs a lot of money. Um, yeah. Doug. Yeah, well, let me just point out that there are going to be some investors who get burned. They're gonna, it, it's a risky technology. It's a hard technology and some efforts will fail. You know, I don't think the whole industry will fail. Um, 
you know, there was a discussion earlier today about quantum winter. I don't think there's going to be a quantum winter, but I think that some people will get frostbite. <laughs> <laughs> Frostbite hurts, it can prevent you from walking, but um, there'll be more SPAC deals. What's, what's the next company in quantum doing a SPAC deck? Free investment advice. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, we know, and I've heard discussions, you know, when Quantinium was announced, that they will go public one way or the other, but don't know if it's going to be through a SPAC or an IPO. I think it's probably maybe the next company. And, and do we expect, um, personally, I think uh, venture capital, especially at the seed stage and, and A round stage, uh, will be prudent over the next 12 months for these reasons that you also explained, David. But uh, more, more big deals have to happen because it is uh, expensive. But, uh, what do you guys think? I do, sorry, I, I do just want to point out that you are absolutely right. This is really a sideshow compared to like the semiconductor industry. When we, yeah, exactly. we, when we ran those numbers, we yeah. found that it was actually $8 billion invested in the same time frame, like this uh, point up to 2021 at Thanksgiving. So this is still really small compared to the, the larger compute industry. Exactly. Yeah. And it's, yes, it's small, and yes, there's risk, but the, the payoff is... That's life. There's risk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Where there is risk, there is opportunity. We have a four minute left um, time for predictions. We wouldn't be good analysts without predictions. Uh, Doc, you have a prediction about new hybrid uh, quantum computing? Well, well um, you know, one of the things to think about is how is the industry going to scale up towards the million qubit computer? And I believe that one of the most important technologies that we'll see over the next two to three years is. Uh, various forms of multiprocessing, mm. either with, with clusters or uh, multi-core or multi-chip. I, I think what Rigetti announced with their 80 qubit machine and, and four chips is just the first example of that. But I think we're going to see many more. I see that in a lot of companies' roadmaps. And um, it's sort of independent, on the mode, independent of the mode, modality, but I think it's going to be very important as we move forward. Uh, James, we touched on it. Uh, talent was part of your prediction, I believe. Yes. Um, with that, I, this is something that you will hear many times throughout this conference. So it, it's not the most original, let's say, but the absolute imperative is that you must co-design the software with the hardware. If you have really neat hardware that can't do anything, what use is it to anyone? And we've seen that play out in, I shouldn't name names, but we've seen that play out in the classical compute space as well. So it, it is really imperative that we have the software, the toolkits to bring in people who don't have a background in, in quantum mechanics to be able to write software for these systems. You had a similar prediction for what's important in the next... Um... Well, there's, 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 one, there's one that I, I wanted to pick up as, as my prediction. You know, we've got uh, you know, fault-tolerant quantum computing still a way off. NISC variation algorithms are struggling to get over the line. I think we're going to hear a lot more about few qubit quantum computing applications. Uh, there's some interesting examples. There was a great piece, I think, QC, where we're involved with CRNS. It's a bit obscure and it's in um, MP proof verifications, but it, it illustrates that you can do unique things with just even one qubit in that case. Uh, and those types of things have more implication on, on the quantum internet in a, in, a, in a slightly different path. Um, and there's one this afternoon, Duncan Jones is, is speaking about a very real near-term application. Uh, I certainly like it a lot, uh, a, a unique way of, of dressing up quantum numbers, quantum random numbers. And I'd encourage everyone to you know, see his pitch this afternoon and see whether it convinces them. Shaheen, in our prep, you had uh, three predictions for the future, yes. um, pick one. I'll, yeah, okay. <laughs> I'll just follow with the software stuff. I think the, the voodoo factor in quantum computing is off the charts. Somehow magic happens, and I think to think the right way is just really difficult. I mean, we've seen the same thing going from CPU computing to multi-CPU to GPU, and like, okay, that's just parallel processing. And then you go to FPGAs, and then to just figure out that, oh, that means really long pipelines, yeah? Oh, yes, okay, just I have to think that way now. And then to go now to quantum computing, that's a really big stumbling block. And every video that I watched, and I watched hundreds of them, 
just when you get to the point where you really don't understand it, magic happens. <laughs> and you still don't know, right? <laughs> so that kind of, kind of, you know, this leads to a problem. And I think the problem is sort of the imposter syndrome in quantum computing is that you sort of start reading and say, oh, even Feynman had difficulty understanding it. <laughs> what chance do I have, right? <laughs> so to fix that, we need to really explain things better, have frameworks that are understandable, and software. So I'm really counting on software to shift us from how does it work to what does it do? And the same thing is happening in, in traditional computing. Like, you know, we don't know how bits happen at down the chip level. It's already quantum effects there, but we don't care anymore. So we need to get to a point where most people don't care. Good, um, we have to wrap up. Uh, I think I speak for everyone when I say we feel privileged to be working in quantum as um, uh, non-experts and uh, uh, not having a PhD from MIT. Thank you, Will Oliver. Um, but we get to talk to users, academics, investors all day long and, and, and think about it. If you haven't signed up to the quantum computing report, uh, do it. That's the best way to reach you, Doug. Yes. Shaheen, where do people reach you? Orionx.net. James.Sanders at spglobal.com. Backbasedinsight.com. Thank you very much. Um, happy to chat more about practical quantum computing. Thank you, Andre. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.